let's create a, an absolutely selfish world. That means what I want for myself, I want for everybody in the world. Since the dawn of humanity, we the mortals are obsessed with something during our youth. It's, it's a question, it's a burning question that what is the truth? What is the reality? What is behind the curtain of life? Why are we born? Why do we grow up? Why do we die? Where do we go? And if at the end, if we have to die, then what's the point of all of this hustle and bustle and this jigsaw puzzle of life? where you have to go through pain, uh, pleasure, you have to win, you have to lose. We've been struggling through with this question for generations and then we are bestowed upon oracles, prophets, saints, gurus. And uh, then in an awe and in a shock, we go, we ask them questions. We want to listen to their answers. We want to soak in their wisdom only for the pursuit of truth. From Buddha to Krishna, from Moses to Muhammad, peace be upon him, we have been exploring, delaying, experiencing truth in different shades. On one hand, we have this quest for the truth which unites us, but on the other hand, it's the answers that divide us into religion, sex, and fractions. And there have been many extraordinary people who've come to this world and who have an access to the window of the unseen. People who've had the opportunity to interact with them have been privileged. And I must say every single one of you sitting here today is privileged because we have the presence of Sadhguru with us. He is a man who is dedicated to physical, mental and spiritual well-being and also gifted with the utter clarity of thought and perspective. His areas of involvement diversify from architecture to visual design to painting, poetry, driving, aviation, sports and music. Can we please give him a standing aviation? Welcome, Sadhguru. Jananam Sukadham Maranam Karuna Milanam Maduram Smaranam Karunam Kalavashadiha Sakalam Karunam Samayadipate Akilam Karunam Good afternoon, everyone. I said, good afternoon. <laughs> I thought you're not already on talking terms with me <laughs> Well, uh, if I can just explain the chant, what it is, is... <clears throat> well, Bilal was raising these questions, why are we born, from where we come, where we go, all this. Well, we can get to those questions later, but right now, what are we here as we sit here? What we call our life is, on one level, just a combination of two things, time and energy. Time is rolling away for all of us at the same pace. You can't hold it, 
You can't stop it, you can't accumulate it. You can accumulate wealth, you can accumulate money, you can accumulate knowledge, but time is running away for all of us. People may think they're doing different things, but every minute, we're just one minute closer to our grave, that's all that's happening. We think we are going here, we are going there, we are going somewhere else, no. As far as the physical existence of who we are, we are going straight to the grave. Hello? This is not my wish. <laughs> That's how life is designed. So time is running away for all of us. But how come one human being is here, one human being is another, one is joyful, one is misery, one is success, one is failure? It's the energy, how you manage this. E either you can turn it against yourself, or you can make this into a phenomenal process. If the intensity of your energies, life energies are managed in different ways, what somebody does in ten years, you may do it in one year. So, if you live here for hundred years, people feel that your impact on life on this planet is like a thousand years, simply because of the intensity of who you are. So, the chant was just about this, but the last line was about, but if you become samayadipate, that means if you become master of time, then you are, you are delivered into a completely different space because time is a concern only because of our physical nature. How, pr how deeply you are identified with your physical body, to that extent time rules you. You don't have to look at your watch, as we sit here, slowly your bladder will tell you it's two hours. <laughs> Just. So what you call as physical body is cycles of time, what you call as planet is cycles of time. What you think is a day is just a rotation, what you think is a month is a rotation of the moon and what you think is a year is a revolution of the planet. Everything is in cyclical motion. One who transcends this cyclical moment of physical nature, now he becomes a master of time, then life moves into a completely different dimension. This is the aspiration of the human being. Knowingly or unknowingly, everybody is aspiring for it, but if you aspire consciously, there is a possibility. Please. So you just mentioned that uh, every single day we are going towards our grave. Uh, I strongly believe in that. Not that you believe you are <laughs> I think we are all stopwatches and we have a stopwatch on top of our head which we can't see. I think all of us are on life support even though we can't see it because we don't control our, our breath, our next breath, but we yet want to be in control. Uh, we are dying every single day. So what's the whole purpose? I mean, I would want to be in control of what my plans are in two weeks, two months, people plan for two years. What's the whole purpose though? What's the purpose of planning? Purpose so that… Of trying to control when you don't control when you come in and you don't control when you go out. No, 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 you could control when you go out. <laughs> when you come in is not your business, somebody else did that <laughs> That also somebody planned, all right? They planned, it was their plan that you must come in at this time. But when you go is your plan. You can plan, isn't it? But people who come under, you know, car accidents, they have not planned, it just happens. Bad driving. <laughs> See, we must understand this. Physical world, physical reality is subject to various forces. If you manage those forces well, you will ride it. If you don't manage it, you will get crushed by the same thing. So many people are using their cars to make their life every day, yes or no? One day, either because of your mistake or somebody else's maybe, somebody did not handle that force properly, speed properly, suddenly you're dead. But there are so many millions and millions of people across the planet who are handling this right and making their life, isn't it so? If there was no automobile, you think I would have reached here or you would have reached here? Maybe you live here, but I wouldn't have reached here <laughs> I'm saying it's making our lives. Well, when we don't handle it right, it'll crush us, of course. This is the nature of the world and it's good it's like that because if competence is not rewarded, 
and incompetence is not punished, there would be nothing to live for here. Isn't it so? What would you live for? So, if I'm sitting on a plane and the plane crashes, I, I, I'm not controlling that. It is 737 then <laughs> Most generally, women do not dare to fight against… Hey, they're fighting all the time, <laughs> within the house <laughs> The place of the fighting which is where I'm coming. So they do not dare to fight against few corrupt police system and bureaucracy. I come from India, so I'm talking in terms of my country. When logic fails, women like I face threats that malign and question our chastity in the process. How do I win this over and still keep continuing to voice out, especially in places like a police station, being a woman? Uh, you shouldn't be going to the police station. <laughs> I, a lot of people don't go to the police station. You all go to the police station? No. Well, either uh, somebody did something wrong, so you went to report it, or you did something wrong and you got a ride, free ride. This happens once in a way, the less it happens the better. Police are there to handle situations only when they go wrong. How often in a society situations are going wrong will determine how often we are all going to the police station, isn't it? The idea of civilization is to minimize that. We've not been able to eliminate that, but we must minimize that, that our life situations don't lead us to police station, prison, hangman, whatever. <laughs> it shouldn't go there. But unfortunately, we've never managed to create a society where nobody goes there. Somebody is always going there. How much percentage of people are going there is the important thing. Anyway, for your information, India is one of the least police states, okay? For the amount of population you have, the number of police you have is very minimal. Most people never go to the police station, they sort out their issues in the village, in the town by themselves. Well, uh, in United States, for example, if a mosquito bites, they'll call 911. In India, it's not like that. Even if a tiger comes, we try to deal it, <laughs> deal with it ourselves. <laughs> and about what you are saying about police, whatever you experience, that's not true everywhere. Police have come a long way in India. But uh, you must understand the systems of policing in India. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but the systems of policing in India largely come from the British era. When the English were there, they created police to control people. Not to make them safe, but to control and oppress people. That was the purpose of the police at that time. But the same training processes, actually same training institutes are still training our police. Same systems. So still many of the police have still same attitude, that they still think they are an occupation force. The freedom has not entered their as an idea has not entered their head, not all of them, much has changed, but still there are some. So you may face something, it is on the way out, you have to bear with it because when a nation goes through centuries of occupation, the hangover of occupation remains in people's minds. That has to go, we have to work it out. Um, my question is on competition and as most of the students here would know, LSE has a very intense culture of competition and a lot of the students who come here have always been at the top of their class and once they come here they continue… How can everybody be at the top of their class? <laughs> they sit there? All different classes. <laughs> oh, how can everybody be at the top of their class? Only one person is at the top of the class, isn't it? That's how I understand the top. 
Yeah, but yeah. once they come here, they, they're not the top anymore because everyone used to be the top, so oh. that kind of disappoints them a bit. <laughs> um, anyway, so once they come here, there is a big culture of competition and there's a lot of comparison that takes place, whether it's comparing grades, achievements, internships, everything. I myself, for example, am not a very competitive person. I don't really engage in that with others. But being in this hyper-competitive environment, I sometimes question myself, should I be more competitive? So my question for you is, what is the meaning of competition, both for individuals and society? And um, does competition make us grow and evolve, or should we solely focus on ourselves? Those who do not have any sense of their own competence will become competitive because their only pleasure is being one step ahead of somebody else. I am on top of the class, what does it mean? And you say, I have known this. When I was in school, can I tell you a small incident in my school? I went there only when it's really necessary <laughs> <clears throat> So, uh, I remember, I don't know, uh, maybe at this level you're not, but in schools maybe it's still there, I don't know the practice. It always was a yellow-colored card. And uh, every month this card is given to you, your report card. And I see some children are strutting around because they are first, second something. Some are sitting in some corner and crying, they're afraid to go home, I don't know what they got. As far as I was concerned, it was given to me, I just took it and gave it to my father. I never once opened and saw, because I thought this was a transaction between the teacher and my father <laughs> I was not going to look into that. And I was quite certain what would be there in it as far as the numbers are concerned, because it was always six zeros. <laughs> because I never wrote a single word in the test paper. That was a rule for me. But apart from the six zeros, the teachers wrote some literature in my… <laughs> in my report cards. So I give it to my father, he opens it and he just blows up every time. I just look at him, what happened? Just a card between, I don't know, it's some I thought it's a love letter from my teacher to my father, but he blows up every time he sees that. <laughs> because why I'm saying this to you is, being better than somebody, if it's a pleasure for you, you enjoy other people's failures. I call that sickness. It's not such a <laughs> You, as a life, you want to be at your fullest. You have a right to be. Every life in creation, from a worm, insect, bird, animal, even a plant and tree, all striving to their best, isn't it? You also. But why are you concerned whether somebody is behind you? Why is it so pleasurable for you that somebody else, else is less than you? From early kindergarten levels, this sickness has been brought into human mind, which is causing so much unpleasantness on the planet such ugly situations everywhere, but we don't seem to learn. So we've created schools where children are never graded. We're looking at them as individuals, what we can do to evolve them to their fullest possibility. Now the problem is this, all life has happened like this. What do you think? You think a blade of grass is less important than an oak tree in the garden? Hello? You think so? Only a fool would think so, isn't it? Hello? But that's what we're doing, that's… we call this education, we call this competition, we call this society. No, very stupid way of handling things. Because the important thing is, for what you have come with, will you blossom to the fullest human being or not? This is the only question. This doesn't need anything other than constantly nourishing the atmosphere, not even the person. If you want a plant to grow, you don't do anything to the plant, you just take care of the soil, the atmosphere, the ambience. That's all that needs to be taken care of even for a human being, that you need to take care of the atmosphere so that everybody finds the fullest expression for their life. The moment you think you want to be better than somebody else, 
you've gotten sick in some way and this sickness has permeated into the world in a huge way and we think this is the way to become, com you know, uh, to achieve uh, something in our life. So if everybody is lame, you're a little faster and you think you're doing fantastic. You'll enjoy other people's being… other people being crippled, yes? Hello? If your entire life is always sitting on top of everybody else, you will enjoy other people's incapabilities, isn't it? This is not good for you, this is definitely not good for humanity. My question is on uh, pain and stress. So I, I think our ally… our… our… our ally… arrival to the world uh, from the time we come out of a mother's womb is through stress, no, 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 pain. No, no, go further back, somebody had pleasure <laughs> And even a mother, when she delivers, in spite of extreme pain in the body, you see mothers are delirious, ecstatic, yes or no? Tears of ecstasy, they're all dripping, though physically they've gone through an enormous amount of pain. So don't say your life started with pain, no, it's not so. Okay. <laughs> so this… this is what I wanted to come to, that pain I think leads to prosperity, everything… Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think pain leads to prosperity and in life if you have goals, they have a price tag, that includes <laughs> pain, hard work, resilience. And when is… The, when this is the case, then why do a lot of people shy away from stress? Because I… Uh, <laughs> from… On an, on an individual level, up until I am alive, I want to achieve goals uh, and it will come with a lot of stress and pain. And then I can rest when I'm below because I'll spend more time in the grave than I will outside the grave. Do you think this is the right mentality or what is your comments on oh, this approach? this is a sure way to mess yourself up <laughs> This is a… this is a serious mistake a whole generations of people have done that if you study, how should you study? Hard, you must study hard. If you work, how should you work? You must work hard. Why didn't they tell you, you must study joyfully? Why didn't they tell you, you must work lovingly? No, you must do everything hard and then you complain. You complain about everything in life because you're doing everything hard. There is substantial medical and scientific evidence to show you only when you're in pleasant states of experience, does your body and your brain work at their best. Is that important for you to perform any activity in life well, that your body and your brains are working well? Hello? Is it important? Tell me if you are stressed and anxious, does your body and brains work at their best? Our body can get immune to it and that is how, you know, like in the gym when I stress my muscle, it grows when it breaks. So like that, we can also get ourselves immune. No, even immune. if you joyfully run, climb a mountain, play a game, still muscle will get well. Hello? <laughs> so under stress, it would get better, it would break and then it will build no, better together. No, no, no. See, stress means you're always finding more and more exotic words for this. Somebody says stress, somebody says tension, somebody says anxiety and goes further, all right? There are many, many names. There are some seventy-two, seventy-four different kinds of mental ailments so today that they have identified. Lots of exotic names. Essentially, it's just this. Your intelligence has turned against you. Once your intelligence has turned against you, no power in the universe can save you, that's all. If your intelligence was working for you, would you keep this blissful or stressful? Please tell me. You make your choice, I'm going to bless you right now <laughs> If your intelligence was functioning for you, what is your choice for yourself? Blissfulness or stressfulness? What you want for your neighbor? Maybe debatable. You know, we are neighbors elsewhere <laughs>
So Sadhguru, our mothers have set amazing benchmark. In the moment you say mothers, yeah. they're giving a sound ambience of babies crying. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. That's the halo effect, I think. Yeah. So they've set a quite a big benchmark of being an ideal wife. However, I or girls of my generation feel that we cannot be as good as wife as my mother has been or our mothers have been. So should I feel that I am falling short of my, in my personal life or should I feel that I'm not giving enough justice to my marriage once I'm married? How should I feel about this? <coughs> you know, our center in the United States is in Tennessee. Tennessee is a little one kind of state, okay. Mary Makowski, that's not Romanian, right? Mary Makowski got married and uh, after their honeymoon they came home and uh, she threatened him that she's going to make a dinner all by herself. I'm sorry, she… Uh, <laughs> she said she'll make dinner for the new husband. And husband came home from work and she served the dinner and he put it in his mouth and slowly he was chewing on it and went into profound thought. Then she was very excited about this dinner and she said, the only two things my mother taught me how to cook, the meatloaf and the apple pie. Then he looked at her and said, darling, which one is this? <laughs> so, your mother, your grandmother, how they made good wives, largely it was believed the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Uh, today your husband uh, will call uh, Uber Eats and uh, <laughs> whatever quick picks and this and that and swiggies and whatever, all right <laughs> So, you can't make a good wife based on how your grandmother became a good wife. You can't become a good wife based on how your mother became a good wife. Situations have changed, expectations have changed. Hmm? It's not in the stomach anymore. For some it's gone up into the head, for some it's gone further south <laughs> Yes? So, you don't uh, do that. Essentially, what a husband and wife means is, because you're not geared, most people are not geared, very few people in this world are geared, to make this journey a life all by themselves. They're organized enough within themselves totally. They never feel anything missing in their life because they've made themselves like that. But most people need somebody else to lean on. Either emotionally, psychologically, there are needs in a human being, physical needs, psychological needs, emotional needs, maybe social needs, economic needs, variety of needs. To fulfill these needs, you want to find one person that you can depend on. Because it's very difficult even to find one person who… with whom you can share everything that you have, your body, mind, emotion and works. So this is the idea. Formalizing it is so that every time you get little… some little friction, you don't fall apart, so little tying up so that things don't fall apart very easily, all right? <laughs> Nothing else. The biggest mistake humanity made was, they started saying marriages are made in heaven, that's why it's such a mess <laughs> What's done here? If you see, marriages are made between us and we took responsibility for who we are, how oh, we could have made it work, but the damn thing is made in heaven. <laughs> Not suitable here, it's because it's alien stuff. Everything is a mess because you think it's made elsewhere by somebody else. If you understand it's made by you for your well-being, to fulfill your needs and your purposes so that you can go through this journey of life with least amount of trouble and friction, then you would handle it more responsibly, isn't it? And according to contemporary needs, not how your grandmother did her marriage, 
You can't do it that way because expectations and situations have completely altered themselves. So, if you hold somebody, who is your friend and who is your need, you must understand. You are in this relationship because you need. Maybe the other person also needs, but that's from their side. As far as you are concerned, you made this relationship because you need it badly, isn't it? If you understand and you're always grateful for this, that somebody is fulfilling all your need, you would handle it well. You wouldn't make a misery out of it. But now you think somebody else needs you, then you'll make a mess out of it. You understand, you need it. Well, the other person also needs to understand he needs it. Now there is a question. If you think, oh, you need me, so I'm going to exploit you. No, this is not about you squeezing happiness out of somebody or they squeezing happiness out of you. If two happy people meet, then there can be something wonderful happening between them. But you are a misery and you think somebody else should be the source of your happiness, well, it'll multiply. <laughs> Can I quickly add on this because I think we, have, we share the border and the culture. <laughs> um, I can relate to what she's saying. So I think what she meant is that our mothers have put certain expectations and that is as men what we have seen as well growing up. And that is what I think is as even younger generation we are millennials but we've seen our mothers treat our fathers in a certain way. And maybe as men we also do expect that now. Whereas she, as a woman, is not... Yeah, for me, I cannot do what you want, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and if my future husband is seeing this... She is from the wrong side of the border <laughs> <laughs> Well... Uh... See, this become a habit in everybody that everything, the shortcomings that we have, we would like God to take it usually. That's why people invented somebody up there, everything that I do wrong, it's God's will. Everything that I do right, of course I did it. <laughs> So the next level of passing the buck is the parents, you know, genetics. A little boy, eight-year-old boy, one day came up to his dad and asked, Father, where is all my intelligence coming from? Where does my intelligence come from? So the father said, it must be from your mother because mine is intact. <laughs> so, Everybody wants to pass it somewhere, this is the most fundamental thing. If you want to blossom as a human being, this is the most fundamental thing that you understand. For everything that you are and everything that you are not is fundamentally your responsibility. All the things that you are, all the things that you are not yet, only if you see I'm responsible, you'll explore the full depth of possibilities that you hold. Otherwise, I got bad genes, so what can I do? God is, you know, sitting and standing, you guys are talking God, you know. This is happening everywhere, in different ways, in some cultures more, some cultures less. Whenever something doesn't happen, God's will. This has to stop. This is my fundamental mission, religion to responsibility. Only when every human being sees for all the damn things that we are and all the things that we are not, we are responsible, we could become a great society, a great humanity, a great generation of people. Otherwise, everything that we do, of course, we're very proud of that, whatever we could not do. How convenient is it? If that is not invisible, of course, parents, next level. No, you must understand this, whatever has come to you, whichever way it's come to you, still what you make out of it is still yours, isn't it? Hello? Whole lot of people, even if you bowl a googly, they hit a sixer, some of them, you know what I'm talking <laughs> Even if the worst ball is bowled to you, you still 
make much out of it if you know how to do it, isn't it? A whole lot of people, when the worst possible situations were thrown at them in their lives, they have risen into phenomenal human beings, haven't they? Yeah. Huh? You have examples, Mahatma Gandhi's, Nelson Mandela's, many, many like this all over the world at different <laughs> levels. These may be famous ones, but there are many unknown ones all over the place, isn't it so? In every society, there are many, many men and women like this. When the worst of situations were thrown at them, the best came out of them. But others complained, others pointed fingers at somebody else. Some took it upon themselves. Look at nature and see, if you throw the worst kind of filth to a flowering plant, see this is what comes out. If you throw filth, fragrance will come out. Should this not be your intelligence too? What world throws at you is not your choice. Something gets thrown at you, what you make out of it is yours, one hundred percent. Sadhguru, I think we today live in a society that is very goal-oriented and we constantly… Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. We no, I'm the one who should lose being losing my voice, <laughs> not… Um, and I think we constantly look for numbers and tangible things to prove our achievements. Um, and I think that people get so obsessed with their end goals that they forget to enjoy the process. Uh, for example, at LSC, a lot of people see their degree as a means to an end. And as a result, they forget to enjoy their time while they're here because all they think is like, oh, that career that this degree is going to bring me or that place that this degree is going to bring me to. And so my question for you is, which is more important, the process or the end goal? And are we able to move forward if we only focus on the process? See, that's because a whole lot of people have kind of wrongly conceived that life is some kind of a race. If life is a race, of course you must win. If you win, what should happen? You must get to the finish line first <laughs> You didn't get that. If it's a race, you must get to the finish line first, isn't it? That's the intent of a race. You know what's the finish line? You know what's the finish line? <laughs> you want to get there soon? No, no, we don't want to get there soon, isn't it? We will get there, we know, but we're not in a rush to get there. We do our best to see that we don't get there soon. So definitely this is not a race. So, what is it that every human being is trying to achieve? Right now, being in an atmosphere like this, uh, maybe you're thinking of profession, maybe a business, maybe getting to some place, I don't know, maybe you're trying to win an award or something, I don't know what. But you must understand, whether it's money or wealth or recognition, fame, name, whatever it is, Essentially what you're trying to do is, you want to experience life a little more than the way it is right now. Somebody thinks it'll happen with knowledge, somebody thinks it'll happen with money, somebody thinks it'll happen with pleasure, somebody thinks it'll happen with, uh, you know, relationships or something else, doing something in the world, or somebody thinks it'll happen only when they go to heaven. But all of them are seeking the same thing. I want you to understand, the man who goes to the bar and the man who goes to the temple are seeking the same thing through different means, fulfillment, isn't it? Yes or no? I know, a lot of people don't like it. Hello? <laughs> Religious people won't like it, but the fact of the matter is, everybody is seeking the same thing. You want your life to become larger than the way it is right now, isn't it? You want your experience of life to become more profound, more intense, more something. Why do you think half the people are on alcohol and drugs? Simply because they're seeking an experience. And they found chemicals are the easiest way to have a large experience. Tomorrow you're broken, that's another matter. But right now there is an experience. Why do people want to go to heaven? Because they think the experience out there is better than here. 
at least that's a marketing <laughs> That is… that's what the advertisements say at least. If it's such a great place, why don't you go today? No. You must be really psyched to want to go today. All others just play with it to the extent it's comfortable. They're just trying to handle heaven, they're just trying to handle their psychological situation with heaven as a fruit up there. Because if you remove it, they'll get fearful, where am I going then? But if you really believe it's a better place, you must be gone today before all these fools get there, isn't it? <laughs> Hello? Because you want to be on the top of the class. <laughs> so, we must understand this, that this is not a race. This is not a race. This is not something that you're going to win or lose. See, you don't have to fear about this life. It is not like LSE. <laughs> you understand? You only if you study to a certain extent, only if you do this project, only if you write this paper, you will pass. It's not like that. Everybody shall pass here. Hello? <laughs> This is not unfair like LSE, <laughs> everybody shall pass. Only question is, how profound is my experience of life, isn't it? How do you make it profound? That's a question. Right now, suppose I'm saying, just for example, suppose you start seeing something more than everybody else is seeing, would your life become somewhat profound compared to others? Hmm? If you start hearing something more than others are hearing, would it become profound? Yes or no? So essentially it's enhancement of your perception which makes you profound. So to enhance your perception, you drink, you drug, sexuality, food, this, that, a million things, success, money, destroy the whole damn planet just to make your experience little more <laughs> profound. I'm saying all human experience, all human experience, misery or joy, agony or ecstasy, anything or anything, everything comes from within you. Is it so? Hello? The stimuli may be from outside, but both pain and pleasure comes from within you, isn't it? If you just take charge of the fundamental <coughs> process of what generates experience within you, the seat of your experience, if you sit there consciously, you can create any experience you want. Look at my eyes, I'm always stoned. <laughs> yeah. Never touched a substance, but always like this only. <laughs> People wonder, how is it Sadhguru, eighteen, twenty hours a day, non-stop, seven days of the week you're going on, you don't go crazy, how is it? Because I'm stoned all the time, <laughs> nothing seems to bother. Stoned on what? Huh? Please tell me. Is is this human mechanism the most sophisticated and complex chemical factory on the planet? Is it? If you were a great manager of things, would you create very pleasurable chemistry or a messy chemistry? Because you had decided you want to make it hard. <laughs> if you were a good manager of things, would you make a pleasure a pleasurable, enjoyable, ecstatic chemistry or would you make miserable chemistry for yourself? What would you do? Pleasurable but… Ecstatic? Yeah. Yes. But the world wouldn't agree to that, the world would throw its own… Why… Mood. why should the world agree? Huh? Yeah. I'm blissed out. They don't agree, that's their problem? No, like the, the world will still throw its struggles and challenges. They do, of course they do. Especially if the world is throwing things at you, is it not all the more important that you're blissed out? Hello? Of course. Especially the world has the, you know, not necessarily by intention, they've become like that. <laughs> simply, not necessarily because they hate you, simply people are throwing things at each other all the time. Especially when you're living in a world like that, is it not very important? If the outside situation is not conducive, you keep yourself absolutely conducive for life. Is this not very important? 
But most people do not even know how to sit here peacefully. Forget about ecstasy in their life, they've never seen that. You have to pump some chemical into them for them to know some sense of blissfulness, otherwise they don't know that. I'll tell you. Can I tell you a situation? Of course. I was supposed to speak at Tel Aviv. I'm flying out of Atlanta, I am to land there in the morning, mid-morning and speak at 6.30 in the evening. But due to some flight delays and stuff and I land at 6 o'clock in the evening. So I'm traveling an American airline, nothing edible on the plane. <laughs> so I'm famished, I'm super hungry. But uh, I land at 6 o'clock, so I quickly change in the airport and I'm rushing to the venue because in this thirty-seven years, as I said earlier, in this thirty-seven years I've never been late to a single event yet. So, <laughs> though sometimes in a day I'm in two different countries, in three different cities, things like this, still I've not been late. This will take a lot of work because I don't want people who come on time to feel like idiots. Isn't it? People who come on time must be honored. People who come late must be f made to feel like idiots. But right now in most of the events, people who come on time are the idiots, people who come li late are the important people. <laughs> Isn't it so unfortunately social situations have become like this. So I'm rushing to the venue. And when I land at the venue, to my amazement, this doesn't happen at all to me, I am speaking at a fine restaurant. When are you this hungry? <laughs> Just the place to go. <laughs> then I walk in, people are already coming in, they're greeting me and one man comes up to me and says, Shalom. I ask him, what does it mean? He says, this is the highest way of greeting. I say, that's your opinion. But what does it mean? He says, no, no, this is really the highest way of greeting. I said, fine, what does the word mean? He said, it means peace. Then I say, why is peace the highest way of greeting unless you're born in Middle East? <laughs> in South India, if you come in the morning and say, peace, I'll say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so, anything we are deprived of, slowly we will export it to heaven. Today, if we say peace, we say divine peace. If you say love, divine love. If you say bliss, divine bliss. These are all things human beings are capable of. Hello? Are you capable? At least some moments in your life, you're peaceful, you're joyful, you're blissful. Does it happen to you? These are all human qualities. Certain idiots have exported it to heaven. And it's becoming harder and harder to get there. Now you're evolving a philosophy, how to suffer through my life and achieve something. What will you achieve? We'll just bury you. Or if you come to India, we'll burn you. <laughs> but that will happen anyways, you know, yes. you are meant to… So anyway, it's going to happen. What is the most important thing? This life should find full expression in this limited amount of time that we have, isn't it? If you want to find full expression, there is substantial scientific and medical evidence to show you, only when you're in pleasant states of experience, will you find full expression to who you are. Does everybody endorse this, please? Hello? Yes, yes. Many of you look too serious for me <laughs> Many people have become dead serious. When I look at the way they're walking on the street, I think they're practicing for the last pose. Please, I want to tell you, the last posture that you will have in your coffin or in your crematorium or wherever, believe me, it comes naturally. <laughs> you don't have to practice it all your life. <laughs> grave. You know what the word grave means? Grave means you're practicing for the grave. No, you don't have to practice. Here you have to practice how to be alive. Death will come. It's life which can happen inefficiently. Death is always super efficient, isn't it so? 
Have you ever seen death happening inefficiently? <laughs> have you? So you don't have to practice it all your life. Life happens inefficiently. Whichever way do it, we do it, there is a better way to do it. Huh? Whichever way you do it, still there is a better way to do it with life, isn't it? Death you can't do any better, you don't have to strive, it will happen perfectly, believe me. It doesn't need you. Uh, my question is, I, everyone's looking for happiness. Uh, do you think that it is achievable? Because I believe <laughs> happiness is a goal, uh, it's, it's a temporary feeling, it goes away. <laughs> Some people do drugs, buy bags, buy material things, but it is temporary… You're not even looking at me <laughs> uh, Do you think it's contentment and blissfulness that would only come when you are selfless? Is, is that a way to achieve it or is there any what, other way? What is selfless? When you do things… That means you lost yourself? No, when you are focusing on… not on yourself but trying to uplift the society and help others. Which society will you uplift? Your society, isn't it? That is yeah. also self, isn't it? No, no, not just my society, the entire world. Well, it's your world, isn't it? That is also self. But you have a choice, you know, like you can… If you make a choice, that is self, isn't it? True. <laughs> See, all kinds of bombastic words have been thrown around like this, become selfless. That means what? Without a self? Is it possible? Is it your intentions and the no, way no. You no, 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 no. See, I would say just be greedy, okay? You're in LSC. Greedy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, be absolutely greedy. Right now you're very stingy with your greed. Only you want to be well. Suppose you got married, you and your wife want to be well. You got children, you and your children want to be well. Your family wants to be well. Why don't you say, I want all life to be well? Be absolutely greedy about what you want. You want this, isn't it? Every human being wants this or no? You want to be well? Why don't you expand your greed a little bit? Why are you so conjuice? Uh, those of you who don't understand, not from Indian background, conjuice means uh, actually come juice, that means no juice in you. <laughs> you're lifeless. Even with your greed, you're stingy means you're lifeless, isn't it? At least in your greed, be limitless. What I want for myself, I want every life on this planet to have it, why not? What's the problem? Because you have limited time, you can only work for I time. know, I know, in intention, it doesn't take time, isn't it? Hello? In intention, thought and emotion, it doesn't take time, it's only action which takes time. If we are limitless in our intention, our actions will go as far as it can go. But if we limit our very intention, then we become constipated. From being constipated to become conscious is the important journey that we need to make, <laughs> yes? Right now we're constipated. Constipated means what? It happens little by little. <laughs> right now this is how life is happening, little by little, little by little. Now you think it's me, then you get married, oh one more person. Then you have two children, two more people, why? What is the problem? Does it cost any money? Hello? Does it cost any money to sit here and think, whatever the best I want, I want for everybody in the universe? Does it cost you anything? Now what will happen to you is, everything that you can do, you will do in your life. In your life, if you do not do what you cannot do, it's not a problem. But if you do not do what you can do, you're a disaster. I'm just telling you, don't become a disaster by limiting your intent. So, Sadhguru, we will talk a bit about what's going to happen. Close, if you, yeah. We will talk a bit about what's going to happen soon, the Indian elections. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the last election was about Achedin, good days to come. This time it's about India-Pakistan conflict, so… India-Pakistan not in conflict. No. 
just little love affair. <laughs> the love-hate relationship. Blow hot, blow cold, blow… <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, few of us are… few of us here are second-time voters. A lot of them are first-time voters. How do you think we should approach this? How do you think we should see this election coming and how do you think we should decide on that? Is there a certain matrix or anything that we can use in order to understand uh, our own decision-making for our elections, being millennials? You are asking me to make the judgment for you. <laughs> no, I'm asking if you could… So this is one thing. Suppose in India, I give out a call, vote for this party or this person. I may be able to move maybe fifty million to hundred million votes. I will never do that because the idea of a democracy and the idea of uh, secret ballot is that every individual will think for themselves and vote. On 18th of April, I'm getting back all the way from United States just for one day to vote and again come back here. <laughs> and my daughter is in London at that time, I told her, you have to come back. So she's traveling just for one day to vote. So she asked me, whom should I vote for? I said, I won't tell you. Today, there is information everywhere. It's your business to access some information what's happened in the last five years. Should, they, should we give them one more chance or not? Is something that you have to make up your mind. That is the beauty of democracy that even somebody who may be just eighteen years old, who's not done anything else in their life yet, even they can decide the future of the nation, isn't it? If I tell them, all of you vote for this person or this party, this is just feudalism in the name of democracy, isn't it? Whether you vote in the name of a religion or a caste or a guru or whatever, you have destroyed democracy. Democracy means every individual must think, you don't even want to think, why? Because you don't understand democracy, democracy is a participatory sport, it is not a spectator sport that all of us are participants, we are not spectators. Only those people who are standing, standing for election are not the players in the democracy. We are the players in the democracy, isn't it? So it's everybody's business to make some evaluation out of their own understanding, out of their own experience of life, has it gotten better or worse? Don't listen to anybody else, your own life has a chedin happened for you or not happened for you is a judgment you have to make, isn't it? There are many issues a country means. Fundamentally, there are security issues, there are economic issues, there are social issues, and then there may be individual issues of education, health, this, that, everything depending on which strata of society you belong to, right? Based on this, you cast your vote. It may be right, it may be wrong, that's not the point. The, the important thing is, you are thinking for the nation. That is the important part of democratic process. In Tamil language, uh, democracy means jananaikam. This means people are the leaders. You are the leader. It is not that somebody else is a leader. You are the leader. You are only asking somebody to represent you as a leadership, but you are the leader, that's what it means, democracy. So please be a good leader for the nation. Um, as a Pakistani who's studying uh, with Indians here and, you know, we live uh, in harmony… Yeah, outside that region, they do wonderfully well today. Of course. <laughs> this is what my question is that uh, we are divided by border but we share a lot of things. We share poverty, we share hunger, uh, any miseries you name and you know both sides of, of the countries are, are going through it. Um, we have people who go to sleep hungry, sco school children who don't go to school. How do you think this… the youth because the majority of Indian population is youth and, and so is Pakistan. How can you think that we can come together and really alleviate the miseries and work together for a better future? Well, 
That's a dicey question. <clears throat> you must understand this. A nation is not some God-given stuff, okay? Only when you identify or make a nation on a religious basis, you may believe so. Otherwise, we know we made it. We write a constitution, not a God-given document. We wrote it, subject to amendments, subject to changes, as it is required for the well-being of the people. So, what is a nation today in the world is, still we've not come to that place where we can all embrace each other and live as one nation, the entire planet. I wish someday we will get there, but you see you're already brexiting. <laughs> see, what… what Europe has done in the last uh, fifteen, twenty years is a truly phenomenal, fantastic achievement. After World War I, World War II, nobody ever thought the Germans and the French and the Italians and the English could come together. Nobody imagined. Could you have imagined this in 1945? I'm asking you. No. no. But you achieved this European Union. It's not a small thing. Don't think it's just an economic arrangement. It's a huge evolution in human consciousness. Yes or no? Yes. But now you're brexiting. You can say whatever, people have voted for it, <laughs> all right <laughs> People have chosen because for some economic reason or some other fear of immigration or whatever, all right I'm not trying to blame anybody for that, but I'm saying, similarly, this India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, this whole region, including Sri Lanka, Nepal, everything was like one nation. Though politically we were bit different nations, there were times when we were over two hundred different political entities, but still we were one nation in culture, in… in many different ways, in our transactions together. But uh, whatever reason, there's no point doing a historical post-mortem and blame this person, that person, this situation, that situation. It's happened. Somebody drew lines without considering the geography of the land, simply across rivers, across villages, across mountains, simply… simply somebody drew lines, the kind of lines that you cannot defend, the kind of lines that needs constant engagement to keep it safe between the two nations. And above all, see, one thing that we need to bring, if you… if young people, all of you and all of you, if you are interested in the future of this world, We've still not come to that place where people can just live out of their consciousness, leaving their religion, their heaven and stuff and all that. But we must do this much in your generation. The coming generation must do this much. Religion should be a personal pursuit for people. Those who wish to, they pursue personally their own stuff. But this ambitious way of approaching that, my religion should conquer the world, must go. This is one achievement you must do in the next twenty-five years, otherwise with the kind of technological advancements we have, we will have a massive disaster on this planet, isn't it? The days of the sword are over. The days of the sword are over. Now if we continue with the same attitude, we will have a super massive disaster which will not be benefit anybody for that matter, okay? will not benefit the planet, will not benefit any creature on this planet, everybody will be hurt because of this. I am saying, one thing all of you are getting educated in premier institutions, one thing you must carry home, wherever you go, whatever religious background you come from, make everybody understand, your religion is your personal pursuit, do whatever you want, all right? You look up, you look down, you look whichever way you want, it's up to you, all right? Don't tell me where to look. Yes? Don't tell me where to look. Don't force somebody else that this is the way or that is the way. If this one thing goes away, India, Pakistan will settle because culturally there's so much engagement, okay? I would say there was a South Asia conference in Dubai which I recently attended but uh, just at that time there was a terror attack in India and we had to invest, insist that uh, all Pakistanis drop out of the conference and it happened unfortunately. I was looking forward to that engagement, 
but uh, they had to drop out because this thing happened. What this is looking for is, we are all pushing for this, that South Asia region, which means India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Bhutan, Myanmar, this geographically one thing, we are looking at something like EU. Politically you can still be different, you can do whatever damn religion you want, but economically if we come together, we were the most prosperous part of the world at one time. That is because we operated as one at that time in many different ways. But today, there is no way, everybody is trapped in their own little boundaries. So this is one thing we should push for. If you want to push for this, the most important thing is religion becomes just purely a personal pursuit, never a national goal or a, a global goal. It is actually a global goal right now. It should just be personal pursuit, never a global goal. If you do this one thing, India, Pakistan, all these nations and many other nations coming together will become a reality. Um, thank you, Sadhguru, for the wisdom. We would now open up the questions for the floor. And uh, if anyone… you can raise your hands. Uh, thank you very much, Sadhguru, for Where the exciting… Where are you? Hey, I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for the exciting discussion. Uh, so I wanted to ask, normally as students, we start the term very exciting, very excited, and we do things very, as you said, blessfully. But by the end of the term, we, with a lot of outside pressure, we move from blessful to stressful. So my question is how to maintain that positive or pleasant state of experience? <laughs> well, you need to understand the simple mechanics of how this functions. See, now all of us are sitting. I don't want to pick on all of you. Let's say three or four of us are sitting here. Each one of us is sitting in our own different ways. The geometry of your body and your chemistry are very related. How you hold your body will determine <laughs> I'm a quick learner. Listen, this also. No. So, uh, the simple thing that we need to learn is, we become conscious of how we hold our body, how we breathe, how we walk, how we move, and also how our thought, emotion, other things function within us. It just takes… you have the necessary awareness and intelligence, it's just never been applied. You're busy applying it to the world. By applying it to the world, a few situations in the world may change, but your experience of life will not change. See, as a generation of people, never before another generation of people knew these kind of comforts and conveniences that all of us are enjoying, isn't it so? Hello? Aren't we the most comfortable generation ever? Yes. We are. But are we the most joyful generation ever? No. So obviously, by changing the outside situation, we can create comfort and convenience. You cannot create well-being because human experience happens from within. There is… this is not just a random thing, there is an entire science. As there is a science and technology to address external well-being, there is a whole science and technology to address inner well-being. Today our education systems… I'm sorry, I'm not making a critique of an institution like this. Our education system from kindergarten onwards, there is nothing about you. You're reading about the worm, you're reading about the butterfly, you're reading about the plant, you're reading about the globe, you're reading about other galaxies, nothing about this one, yes? But human experience is one hundred percent manufactured within you, is it so? Have you seen in the same given situation, one person is thoroughly enjoying it, another person is immensely suffering it? So obviously it's not the situation, isn't it? You can do whatever you want. Because they did not handle it properly, they invented heaven. 
okay. <laughs> Heaven means what? Should I go into this? <laughs> no. Anyway, everything is fantastic out there. That is the marketing. <laughs> Why nobody wants to go today? Because they don't know if it's really there. <laughs> when somebody believes that it's really there, they will do totally dastardly things. All others, uh, just a little psychologically, hold on. Food is best. If you're, you know, in Hindu heaven, food is <laughs> fantastic. If you're a <laughs> if you're a foodie, you must go to Hindu heaven. <laughs> in another place, all those white gowned ladies are just floating around in the clouds. <laughs> if you like that kind of ambience, you go there. <laughs> in another place, you'll encounter virgin problems. If that's what you're looking forward to, that's where you go there. But you must understand this. You go there only, what is the qualification to go there? You have to die. Hello? Yes. Is that so? In LSE also? <laughs> if you have to go to heaven, you have to die. When you die, we usually either burn or bury or cut you and put you to birds. Depending on your culture, we do whatever. One thing is, this body is alone from this planet. When you're done with it, you must put it back. If you've not done anything ecologically sensitive, this is one thing you will do, all right? So you left your body here and went to heaven. When you don't have a body, what do you do with good food and virgins and all this stuff? I'm asking. These are all bodily issues, isn't it? Hello? When you have a body, all these things. So, I want to down the heavens. People should eat good food here. Hmm? People should float around like angels here. Whatever lustful longings they have when they're young, they must finish it here. They should not become sick dreaming that something is waiting for them up there. What do you think? Should we down the heaven? <laughs> and above all, and above all, do you have any proof? Do you have any proof to prove to me that you are not already in heaven and making a mess out of it? <laughs> do you have any proof? You're already in heaven making a terrible mess out of it. If you sort yourself out, you will see this will feel like heaven. Of all the planets we know, in whatever explorations we have done in this universe, this is the best place. Do you agree with me? Yes. You're already in heaven. Why are you such a mess? You need to sort this out. The only reason why you are such a mess is you are not fixed like other creatures. For all the other creatures, Nature put two lines between which they live and die. But for human beings, there's only bottom line, there's no top line, that's what they're suffering. If you're suffering your limitations, I can understand. You're suffering your freedom, that is what is the disaster right now. If you were fixed like every creature, you wouldn't be stressed, isn't it? All other creatures are like this, stomach full, life settled. But you are made like this, stomach empty, only one problem, stomach full, one hundred problems. <laughs> this is simply because you are not able to handle your own faculties. We gave you a supercomputer, but you did not read the user's manual. That's all your problem is. Thank you. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Uh, I would request you to please guide us more on the issue of whole interpretation of religion as you said that it has to be a personal matter. Uh, religion as a concept as I, you've mentioned before, it was a new concept for India and its surrounding places earlier. But people drew lines on those religious and social cultural aspects as well and which eventually led to conflicts. So how do you see inner engineering, yoga as the way of resolving that conflicts and turning towards the inner self and breaking the barriers of religion. 
Well, uh, you want a prediction or you want a plan? Those who are not incap… those who are incapable of making a plan and executing that plan always look forward to predictions. What prediction means is, you just hope it will happen. You are not willing to lend your life to make it happen. That's why I'm telling you all of you young people, should you strive towards it? Of course, people will deride you, somebody wants to kill you. I have never abused anybody, but people want to kill me, death threats keep coming. What for? Simply because you ask questions for which they have no answers. I have never abused them, I have not abused their gods, I have not abused anything. I'm just asking questions, you went to heaven all right but without a body, so how are you going to eat food, good food and how are you going to do anything with these virgins? What are you going to do when I ask them? Why are they feeling so insulted? So this is one way, for a long time it's been like this for a couple of thousand years. One way to handle questions is kill the questioner. It's been an effective way till now, but no more. It's not going to work like that because today not just one person is going to ask questions, a billion people will ask questions, yes? Once you raise a question, the whole world knows this is a question and everybody will ask the question. There was a time where only one person raised the question in a village or a town and you killed him and the question was over. Those days are over. So this is why you don't have to abuse anybody. But you must ask relevant questions, isn't it? Hello? Daring relevant questions, whatever matters in our lives, should we not ask questions at least, even if you don't have answers? You don't have to abuse anybody, you don't have to deride anybody, but you must ask questions because if you ask three intelligent questions, ninety percent of the scriptures on the planet and all the three heavens will collapse right now. With your blessing, I've started my journey. One question I'd like to share that we meet people we meant to meet or is it a destiny, luck or fate? Have you just fallen in love or something? <laughs> huh? <laughs> no, no, because I don't want to disturb the romance. See, look at it this way, since you woke up today morning, till this moment, let's leave the sleeping time. Since you came awake fully, from that moment to this moment, your body has been doing its things, isn't it so? Physical activity is happening, both outwardly and inwardly, happening or no? That's why we're alive, it's happening. Mental activity has been happening. Emotional activity is happening, energy activity is happening. How much of these four dimensions of activity did you perform consciously from the moment you came awake till now? How much do you think? What percentage? What percentage? Well, below one percent, believe me. When you perform activity consciously, Less than one percent, over ninety-nine percent is unconscious. Everything will look accidental, isn't it? Hmm? Everything looks like divine intervention because ninety-nine percent of the time you're unconscious. Do one thing. When you drive today to wherever you drive, ninety-nine percent of the time close your eyes and drive. <laughs> you will see how many people you will meet. But if you drive with your eyes open, fully conscious, you're not going to meet anybody like with this with the bank. Hmm? Things will happen in a completely different way. How conscious we are will determine how much of your destiny you determine. How unconscious you are determines how much of your destiny is accidental. Everything that's accidental, we want to attribute it to some other force elsewhere. Now this must stop. We must understand, it is we. Is there no other force? Of course, 
You didn't make the creation nor did I, all right? You did not create this creation nor did I create this creation, there is. But that is a different dimension altogether. And what is happening with you right now is entirely your making. From where you come from in India, is the only culture on the planet which constantly told you, your life is your karma. Karma means your doing. Your life is your making. Whatever may be happening, you may be able to logically figure out why it is so, you may not be able to figure out, but still you know one thing, if this is happening to me, this is my making. This is the greatest empowerment you can have when you understand my life is my making. Whatever happened till now, it doesn't matter. How will you make your tomorrow? I'm asking you. If you clearly, clearly know one hundred percent, my life is my making, how will you make the next moment? How will you make a tomorrow? How will you make your future in the most beautiful way? Isn't it so? That's what needs to happen. I have two questions and one is related to the uh, last thing Shoot one said. at a time, I'm a simple guy. Okay. Because <laughs> you were just talking about our life little, is... Little closer. Sorry. Yeah. So that we make our lives, right? And what about... What about the people that have it very hard? What about the people that are exploited sexually? What about the people that have been like in the worst scenarios for many years of, of drudgery. I think it's so unfair. I, I do agree with it, but I think it's unfair to say that this is the responsibility of the individual to be okay. Because for some people no, no, it's no, just you, so you, much harder. You see, I, I made a simple statement, you're making a philosophy out of it. Okay. Okay. There are many segments of society, please. Thank you. Uh, there is a second question. You can hold on to the microphone and sit down, it's okay. <laughs> See, there are various levels of life happening on the planet. In London city, there are richest people living in highest levels of pleasure and comfort. There are people who are living the worst possible life within this city, yes or no? Yes. You don't have to go all over the world to see that, right here. So, if we create a society where there is such disparity, I'm asking, both you and me. Are we responsible for this? That was my second question. No, no, we'll come, we'll come, I just answer the <laughs> question. I'm asking the question now. <laughs> Are we? Yes, Maybe sir. we can't change it tomorrow morning, I know that. But are we? If we see we are, we will start working towards a solution. Otherwise, we'll try to make a living out of problems. A whole lot of people, in this world have invested so much in the problems, they're only making a living out of problems, evolving philosophies of problems. The only thing that matters is a solution, isn't it? Huh? Not in how many ways we glorify the problem, the only and only thing that matters when there is suffering for a human being is a solution. Yes or no? Whether it comes from up, down, whichever way the hell it comes, who cares? Whether it comes from heaven or hell, we don't care. When somebody is in some state of suffering, the only thing that matters is a solution. So if solutions have to happen, who created the problems? You can say it's this guy or this person or that person. No, no, we as human beings have bread problems, isn't it? When I have a glass of water, I am not willing to share it with the person sitting next to me. Why do you expect a man who has a billion dollars to share it with somebody? I'm asking. Hello? When you are not willing to share the little things that you have, you have a philosophy, why are the rich people not sharing it with the poor people? They will not. Because your argument is, but I don't have enough. But even they don't have enough. They may have hundred billion dollars, but they don't have enough, that's what you need to understand. This is the nature of human being. You may think they have too much, but they don't have enough. As you don't have enough, nobody has enough in this world. Yes or no? <clears throat> Only thing is just this, that's why I told you, 
your service, sacrifice, selflessness, all these things, these are all con jobs. <laughs> That's why I told you, at least what is the worst in you? Your greed, expand your greed towards everybody's well-being. We can work towards it. Will all the problems go away tomorrow morning? No, we can only work towards it, isn't it? If all of us work towards it, will it go away? Yes. Hello? Yes. If every one of us really strive towards it, will it go away? Yes, it will, isn't it? Will it or will it not? It will. But till now, the problem has always been about how to get all the human beings on one page. There are different nations, there are different races, there are different religions, skin color, this nonsense, that nonsense, every kind, all right? For the first time, for the very first time in the history of humanity, two things have happened. One thing is, our survival is better organized than ever before. There is enough resource, technology, for every problem we have a solution at hand. And for the first time, we can sit here in this room and speak to the entire world. Never before this was possible. See, many people have come, he, he mentioned names, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, this one, that one, all kinds of people. When they spoke, hardly ten people heard. Yes or no? This is the first time you can sit here and speak to the entire world. When such a privilege is there, is it not your and my responsibility to say the right things? Right things to put all human being, beings on one page? Hello? If we do this, because never before this was possible, now it is possible. As a generation, will we make it possible or are we just a wine generation pointing fingers at each other and we will die like this? This is the choice we have. This is the reason why I'm going from university to university, though I avoided every damn university when I was your age. <laughs> now I'm going to university to university because this is an opportunity which is for the first time in the history of humanity, that if we want to change something, we can, because we have the resource, we have the technology, we have the capability and we can share this with the entire world. Never this was possible. Please, let's make it happen. Um, I love what you said about um, we, we want to blossom as human beings. A little closer, please. Oh, sorry. We want to blossom as human beings. That's how we find fulfillment. I'm actually nervous talking to you. Um, but with new opportunities also comes fear and self-doubt. And I'm wondering, how can we navigate these very strong forces in order to reach our fulfillment, I guess, and our potential? See, uh, there is you, there is a world. Or let's say there is you and there is the rest of the existence. Those forces you cannot ignore, they're all there. I want to fly away, can I fly away? No, there's gravity which holds me down. Like this in every activity, in every possibility, there are forces which support us, there are forces which hold us, there are forces which rise us, there are forces which put us down, all kinds are there. You ever been uh, surfing? No? Okay, if you go either wind surfing or uh, hang gliding or ocean surfing, somebody rides the wave. Somebody who doesn't figure it out gets crushed by the same wave, isn't it so? Hello? Somebody just… just riding on the wave, somebody else <laughs> drowning beneath the wave. Same wave, isn't it? What is the difference, do you think? Somebody figured it out. Somebody did not pay enough attention to figure it out. The most fundamental thing that you need to figure out is not the waves, not the wind, not the sunlight. The most fundamental thing that you need to figure out is, how does this function? Now you're talking about your fears, your anxieties, your struggles. 
these are not waves and wind and fire and something else. These are just your own thoughts and emotions, isn't it? See, please under… I'll make it extremely simple for you. Human beings are suffering, all right? Variety of suffering. There's a champion sitting there <laughs> But I'm asking all of you, leave those people who are in war zones, who are in extreme poverty and some violence, leave them. We can excuse them. Because for them suffering is coming from outside. How much of your suffering ever has come from outside? I'm asking, when was the last time you were stabbed with a dagger even though you were living in London? <laughs> I, I hear a lot of knife crimes in London. When was the last time you were stabbed? Hey, even you were not. No? Yes, I know. But I'm asking, when were you stabbed? No, not you. Nobody in this room. So, what I'm saying is, the amount of suffering that coming to you from outside is minuscule. Rest is on self-help, isn't it? Hmm? Why are you generating suffering for yourself? What is it? Simply because you have not taken charge of your faculties. What is it that you're suffering? If you ask people, you will see, even you, let me ask you, you are capable of suffering that happened ten years ago to you, isn't it? Ten years ago this happened, still suffering. And you are capable of suffering what may happen to you day after tomorrow already. Yes or no? So you are not suffering life, let me make this very clear to you. You are not suffering life, you are suffering two most fantastic faculties that only human beings have, which no other creature have, which is a vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination. You are suffering your memory and your imagination. So what you're asking is, please make me like an earthworm once again, I will live peacefully. If we remove half your brain, for sure you will sit here peacefully, isn't it? No fear, no anxiety, no trouble, nothing. So the problem is, you are complaining about your evolutionary forward movement of life. You want to be back there. If you had the brain of an earthworm, stomach full, you would be so peaceful. Is this the way to handle this possibility, I'm asking you? Hmm? This is the greatest privilege that Every little thing that happens to us, we remember vividly. And we can use this memory to project and try to create those things in our life. This is our greatest privilege which no other creature has on this planet. At least on this planet, we are the most privileged life, but we are the messiest one. Simply because neither your parents, nor your teachers, nor your institutions have done anything as to how to handle your own faculties. They're teaching you how to mess with the globe and of course you messed very effectively. Nothing about how to do this. If you knew how to conduct this, would you create fear for yourself, anxiety for yourself, misery for yourself or joy for yourself? I'm asking you, joy. So the problem is not with the world, the problem is as I said, you have a super, super computer, you are refusing to read the user's manual. <coughs> Just by accident you want to handle this, it's a mess. Uh, last question. Uh, Hi, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm extremely impressed and I have a request, one request and one question. First, I will... Uh, put forward my request. So, we want to be the lucky ones uh, who are in the same room to experience the vibe and aura that Ranveer Singh did when you danced with him. So, <laughs> would you do that for us here in LSC? Guys, I want you to clap if you're up for it. <laughs> we, we get fulfillment. <laughs> What's a question? After the dance or before that? 
Okay, my, my question. There are no so I'm extremely, around. extremely. There's no rock band here, so. So I'm extremely impressed how you've said that religion shouldn't be a national goal. It should be something very personal, and we should talk about the right thing. Uh, but someone. You know, as, as someone so many people look up to, you know, don't you think you have a social responsibility to voice your concerns about some specific parties who are trying to uh, spread religious extremism? Or Because we can't please everyone, can we? So what are your thoughts on that? Because I told you, uh, you, you just said that you don't endorse a political party and you don't want to influence anyone uh, to vote for someone. But don't you think we should stand up against something which is wrong? I am not against anything, that's what I want you to understand. I am for humanity. Human beings have come in variety of ways. It's okay with me. Because if all of them became like me, I wouldn't want to live in this world. They're all different. That's why it's nice, look at them, how different they are, each one. That is why it is nice. But all the idiots are trying to make everybody like themselves. Just imagine in your home, if there's one more person just like you, could you live there? <laughs> one is too much, isn't it? <laughs> but they want a world full of their own kind. So, I'm not against anybody, it's okay, everybody's saying what they're saying. As long as they don't get overly empowered, it's all right, they're expressing their opinions. Opinions are like cataracts. The more you have them, the less you see. So I'm trying to bring clarity to them also. People say, Sadhguru, you are seen with the celebrity, why did you sit with this person? You are seen with this politician, why did you sit with this person? I say, see, for the last twenty-two years I've been working in the prisons, both India and United States. I'm constantly with murderers, rapists and all kinds of people. They're also okay with me. Because human beings do all these things. The question is only, will we as a generation create a situation where human beings can evolve into a higher possibility or do you want to shoot this one, hang that one, do that, do this, is this your solution? Believe me, those people who thought they are bringing solutions forcefully always cause the worst kind of situations on the planet. Yes or no? Those who believed that they're bringing a solution forcefully, they did the worst things, isn't it so? Those who believed they were going to send you to heaven, they did the worst things. Those who believed forcefully they will level everybody and bring equality, they did the most horrendous things on the planet. We don't want to miss make the same mistake. I want you to understand, those mistakes are no more affordable with modern weaponry and modern technology, those mistakes are no more possible on this planet. If we commit the mistake of what the… I'm not supposed to mention these names, what Mussolini's, Adolf Hitler's, Joseph Stalin's and whatever the religious nutcases have done, if we attempt the same thing in twenty-first century, we'll finish the whole humanity. We cannot afford that anymore. So the only way for all of us to progress is that whatever I think of you, you ac we accept you for who you are right now and see how we can all be on the same page, at least on a few things. We all want health, we want all… all of us want to live joyfully, peacefully, at least on these things we are on the same page. Well, you worship that god in the east, I worship this in the west, I… somebody worships something else, somebody else doesn't worship a damn thing, it's their choice. Let them do whatever. But the important thing is, human needs, fundamental human needs are this. Once physical needs are taken care of, which fortunately for this generation, like never before, though still there are complaints, there are segments of society unfortunately left out of that, Still the largest number of human beings, their survival is better organized than ever before. Yes or no? It is so. Today if you have the money, you can go to the store and buy what you need for the next one year and not step out of your house and still manage. Believe me, if you are here 
hundred years ago or thousand years ago, if you want to start your day, you must take your bucket and walk a mile to River Thames to get your water. Most of you are not even fit to carry a bucket full of water for a mile anymore. <laughs> yes or no? So survival is better organized than ever before. Forever we've had problems of food, water, shelter, clothing. For the first time, all of you have five times more clothing than what your grandparents had. Yes or no? Huh? All of you have five times more clothing than what your grandparents had. You are also eating. Right now, how to eat less is the big deal. <laughs> this is the first generation which has to be worried about how much to eat. Always every generation of people, when they sat down for a meal, they stuffed as much as they could into themselves because there was so much physical activity to do. If you see the last generations of people, how they ate, when they sat down for a meal, they would sit like this, you know, in India they'll sit on the floor, they'll eat and it's full and they'll eat little more and little more and little more because there is so much to do physically. If you don't eat like that, you'll run out of gas. Literally it's like gas, you know, <laughs> like filling the tank. You want to fill as much as you can. This is a first generation which has to be conscious of how much to consume because otherwise you'll become like a balloon because you're not doing anything. So everything is better organized than ever before. Survival is better than ever before. This is the time to transform human consciousness. To transform or to raise human consciousness, we are doing various levels of activity. One, you know, you must sit through this in many different ways, otherwise you, will, you won't understand why we are doing variety of things for this purpose, because all these things have to be done. If you don't know all the pawns, there is no game. I want all of you to participate in whichever way you can to raise human consciousness either by yourself or seek our help. We are doing many things across the world, please be a part of it. The important thing is, all human beings, if their focus is towards their well-being and everybody's well-being, irrespective of who they are. He is a… he is a bad neighbor for me, but I want him to be well. All right? This is important. I don't have to say, no, you're a fantastic neighbor, you're not, but I want you well. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not making a national commentary to one, please do not understand. Whether he's uh, from uh, what, uh, from Pakistan or from Kerala, it means the same thing. I'm saying, <laughs> see, I don't have to say fantastic things about you. Yes, you're a bad neighbor, but I want you well, because I know if you are well, you will be fine with me. When you're not well, you will try to infect me with the same thing. It's very important everybody around you are well if you want to be well, isn't it so? Uh, this is why I'm saying be absolutely selfish. It is just that. Why selfishness and greed also you're stingy? Hmm? Why in that also you're stingy? At least in that you can be generous, you can't give away things, all right? At least be absolutely selfish, no? What I want for myself, I want for everybody, hmm? Let's create a… an absolutely selfish world. That means what I want for myself, I want for everybody in the world. Let's make it happen, thank you. I saw you were beating your foot like no, this. No, no, I was just you... testing oh. if it can hold me, but <laughs> <laughs> So would you like to entertain the request? Uh, when no Grace music has... here, please. <laughs> okay, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, thank you very… No, no. Th thank you very much, Sadhguru. Thank you. <laughs> ah.